she was able to grow in the spiritual life and, and really attain to mystical heights to such a depth and profundity in her relationship with God before she entered Carmel. Mm -hmm. She represents a true lay mysticism that's available to us. Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to another season of CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of ICS Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. I'm very excited to uh, announce this season, this new season of CarmelCast, where we're going to be talking about St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Um, throughout these next seven episodes, we're going to dive deep into the life and the spirituality of St. Elizabeth. Uh, and I'm joined today by Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese. Good to be with you, Father. Good to be with you, Brother John Mary. All right. Yeah. So I'm I'm very excited in, in part for selfish reasons because St. Elizabeth of the Trinity is my favorite saint. Mm. So I, I'm really looking forward to, to the, this, um, this season, this opportunity really to share uh, her riches with, with the world. And I want to start maybe just by asking you a question to share, like, what do you think it is that Elizabeth has to share with the world? Like, why, mm. why does someone listening to this? Why do they, why do they care? What are they going to get, yeah. you know, out of this this season? Well, I think for one, just the fact that we're making it a whole season should say something. Just how important she is, mm -hmm. you know. She she has so much to offer, and and there's elements to her teaching and her spirituality that I think have yet to be unpacked. Um, mm -hmm. But in, to encapsulate maybe what what you could say is is what she offers right now the most to our culture and to our church. Um, I think for one is the word authenticity. Um, I think she she just represents someone who she needed to be consistent with what God was doing to her. She needed to give that back in a sense. Like mm -hmm. she, she needed to feel like she was responding with her whole heart and genuinely to what God was doing in her. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing. It was always God's initiative, but her response. And then... Another aspect of it, too, I think she was able to grow in the spiritual life and, and really attain to mystical heights, you could say. You know, maybe that's a term that wouldn't be the best, but just to such a depth and profundity in her relationship with God before she entered Carmel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a key. So uh, she represents a true lay mysticism that's available to us and that she then, even in Carmel, taught her friends and her family about you know how to live in union with God in your state in life now. Um, right. Yeah, and that's something that's going to be so key, I think, to this season is the fact that um, she really is a teacher in a ways, and she's teaching us and, and all of those listening, like how can we reach the heights of, um, the heights of union with God, the heights of the mystical life, um, no matter what our, our situation is in life. That's, I think, really the heart of, of Elizabeth's message. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's a special grace, I think, for today, you know, we're, re we're releasing this first episode on her feast day. So I really do, when we have a, actually we have a relic of her here with us too. So I feel um, her, her presence is with us uh, here in a very special way today. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, just want to encourage everyone listening or, or watching to um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or if you're listening on um, an audio format, be sure to subscribe that way because this is just the first of seven seven episodes. So subscribe to make sure you don't miss um, any of the, the upcoming episodes. And uh, also just another note then before we dive in as well is maybe to say something about uh, the books, the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Um, so if you, you know, if people at home want to read along as we're going through some of this, then they, wh where can they go? Sure. So yeah, we have several ICS publications books of St. Elizabeth's writings and biographies. We have volume one, um, her doctrinal writings, or volume two, it's her letters from Carmel, as, uh, you know, gets more of her personal kind of teaching. And then um, we have a, an anthology of her writings where, you know, kind of bring out some of the highlights of her works. And then This Is My Heaven, a, a biography of St. Elizabeth the Trinity. So, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to start with that we, you know, that we um, distribute and mm -hmm. 
it's a lot you could get into. Great. And when, I know we have some some books uh, coming out soon, too, uh, a few, yeah. couple of books, hopefully. So be on the lookout for those as well. We'll have some new books on Elizabeth of the Trinity. I'll put some links down below to the books that you can find now, especially if you find you know what we're speaking about. If you find that Elizabeth really speaks, speaks to you, to your heart, then uh, look those up, and there's some great resources out there. Mm-hmm. So maybe we can start then now just by like diving into... Elizabeth's, you know, early life, her, her, her very early childhood. Um, so she was born in France, um, the, in the middle of France, in, on July 18th, 1880. Mm-hmm. And um, you'll notice uh, as we go through these episodes, we're probably going to try to draw some connections to St. Therese too, because if you hear France in 1880, um, there was another, you know, Carmelite who was French Carmelite who was alive during that time, and that is, is Saint Therese. Yeah, you think she was just six years older than seven years older than Elizabeth? So. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the two never met each other, but mm-hmm. still, they were kind of in the same environment mm-hmm. uh, there in France. And um, yeah, I think one thing that's important when when looking at a saint is, um, or really anyone's life, is looking at the context in which they were born particularly their family, their parents. Mm -hmm. Um, So what what do we know about, you know, Elizabeth's parents um, that maybe contributed to uh, her holiness and her her upbringing? Sure. Well, we know that um, her parents actually married sort of late. Um, Her mom, Madame Cates, she she was engaged before, and her her fiancé died in in the war, the Franco-Prussian War, Mm -hmm. which is a big blow to her. And it took her several years before she was able to get over that grief, and she met someone else. Um, who Monsieur Cates, uh, Joseph Cates, who um, who was a, a military man, and he was much older. He was actually forty seven when he married Elizabeth's mother, who was thirty three. Um, and he had he actually Elizabeth's mom came from a more of aristocratic kind of background, um, whereas Joseph Cates came from much more humble beginnings. And and but he jo- joined the military and rose up in rank. Um, and then eventually kind of attained a, a great status, you know, in career, but, but still had, was always part of him, you know? So, so Elizabeth kind of has, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, all of kind of society in a way encapsulated in her experience and her family. Um, and so mom, you know, they get pregnant very early on after they marry. Um, and Elizabeth though, when she was almost time to be, to be due, the doctors couldn't find a heartbeat, and it said that she was condemned to death by the doctors. They they said that she she probably would be a stillborn, um, and and yet, after thirty six hours of hard labor, her mom gives birth. And it's one little anecdote that's pointed out by the biographers is that it's right when the prologue of the Gospel of John is being read at a mass that was being celebrated for this birth. You know, because they knew it would be a difficult birth. Um, and so, anyways, just this connection with Elizabeth and the Gospel of John. John was always very dear to her, and that union with Christ that that the evangelist John represents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing that strikes me about her her family, well, her parents, um, is some of the suffering that they went through. You mentioned, you know, Elizabeth's mother, how um, her her fiance was killed in war, but also her father was actually um, in his in his active duty. He was actually taken prisoner in Sedan at some point. So I can't imagine like kind of the trauma and and the difficulties that he had dealing with that as well. And so Elizabeth's born, you know, she's born, she's not born into this um, ideal sort of family, you know, unreal. It, her, her, her experience was very much like, uh, like ours. She was broken, born into, you know, brokenness and suffering in some ways, mm-hmm. um, even the poverty of, of her father's upbringing too. And um, yet it was in the midst of that, that God like really raised her up to become a saint. Yes. And maybe you could just say too, it, very um, providentially with her mom's own experience as a kid. Her mom had her own kind of awakening to the spiritual life, you know, in a deeper way than just kind of the basic kind of maybe piety of that era. You know, she she was introduced to quiet prayer um, as a teenager, and she came to know St. Teresa of Avila, who she really kind of took as her her patroness Mm -hmm. um, and read some of her works and felt very close to St. Teresa. And so you can see even in her mom's maybe diary from when she was a youngster, um, this desire for intimacy with God, this desire to really grow closer to Christ. And, and, and it's something, you know, remarkable, even though it's not that her mom wasn't a mystic, we would say, or anything, you know, and she had her own struggles, as we'll see later on. Um, but, but really that depth, you know, that was there, that, that was in many ways passed down to Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. 
And one thing that strikes me, I mean, I mean, Elizabeth's own, you know, her own birth was was problematic, and you know that they thought she might not make it. But then also, there's just the re- this reality that um, death was a really just a part of her life from very early on. Mm. Um, you know, r- she lost three members of her family uh, at a fairly young age. Uh, the first one was her gr- her maternal grandmother. Um, who died when Elizabeth, I think, was just two years old. And it's interesting, there's actually a letter that Elizabeth wrote to her grandmother when she was sick. And it's uh, Elizabeth's first letter that we have. Um, you can tell, you know, she was only two years old, so she obviously, mm. she couldn't write herself, but you can see, tell it was still her hand. So mm. her mother was probably guiding her hand um, in writing this letter, you know, telling her grandmother that she's praying for her. Um, and so Elizabeth at that young age would have been aware of mm. her of her grandmother and her praying for her grandmother's illness, but then shortly after her grandmother passed away. Yeah. They say, actually, I think in that same letter, she says, I'm praying for you, and I taught my doll to pray for you as well. Yeah. So Liz is already kind of a teacher of prayer. Even right. At the age of two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, would, she would teach her doll and have her doll kneel down in order to pray. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, then, um, so shortly after that, then um, there, was, there was more death, you know, in the family of Elizabeth as well. Yes. Yes, because her... Her grandmother died, her grandfather died, and then Elizabeth's father, who already had some heart problems, um, but they didn't know how serious it was. Mm-hmm. And then when Elizabeth was about seven years old, um, she, she was with them. Then he fell sick, and maybe only a day or two later, he passed. And, and they say he passed in her arms. Elizabeth mm-hmm. was with him, you know, really, really um, just very present to him there. Um, and But what an impact that made, you know, her oh, beloved yeah. father and... Um, she just had the one little sister and then her mom. And, um, and yeah, so to lose her dad, it was a very um, just formative moment in her life. And something that probably amplified that pain was the fact that um, her grandfather had been living with them. So she was close to her grandfather, but also her father had retired um, because of his health. But so he was home all the time. So Elizabeth had grown very close to him. You know, she's four or five years old at this time. She'd grown very close to her father. She's used to having him home and with her, playing with her all the time. Um, and then for him to die in her arms when, when she's seven years old yes. um, made, I'm sure, a huge impact on her. And then even her own, you know, mom's reaction to that. Mom lost her mom, her dad, her husband yeah. after losing her fiance too some years before. You know, so that kind of heartbreak too and how her, her own mom responded to that also would, you know, really pass down in, in, in certain ways to Elizabeth. Mm, yeah. And I mean, we could... You know, maybe speculate some about the the negative impact that this had on Elizabeth, but some of the biographers also point out maybe some of the positive things that this challenge allowed Elizabeth to overcome. And one thing I think is interesting that that some of the biographers point to is that from this point on, Elizabeth seemed to have this fascination with heaven, because mm-hmm. um, right away she would have you know those that she loved most um, were, were taken from her, yeah. and so from this this early age she'd have this fascination with heaven and feel this closeness to. Um, those who had passed away as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the fragility of existence, you know, that most Mm -hmm. kids don't experience until later on in life, you know, most people don't experience, but she had it so early that it would, yeah, open up those, those horizons in a similar way of St. Therese, you know, that that, that you can draw some parallels there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And then one, um, one, well, impact from from these, these deaths, but also what was happening before that is because Elizabeth was part of a military family, they were often moving moving around. So they moved once when she was just nine months old. They moved again um, when she was, I think, two years old is when they moved to Dijon, Dijon for the first time. Mm-hmm. But then when her father passed away, they kind of the family had to downsize, and so they moved once more. Yeah. So you know, we, here we have she's um, only seven years old, and this is already the third time that she's she's moved. And, you know, and at a time, too, when moving was not quite so simple, maybe, as it is today, it was, it was quite a, a thing to move during that time. So um, there's also that um, just the, the lack of stability in life uh, going on with people moving in and living with her and passing away. And, and yes. she's kind of introduced all, to all of this at a, a very young age. Yes. And the fact that she didn't really have extended family either, because her mom was an only child. And so her mom didn't have other relatives to really rely on. And she had lost her parents. And yeah. so, so even more that you're, you're really uprooted and her mom kind of had to, you know, develop very close friendships and sort of a familiar circle mm-hmm. that she could bring Elizabeth and, and her little sister Marguerite. 
yeah. um, into, you know, because they didn't have that stability necessarily. But but she did a great job. I mean, through those social relationships and through a lot of that movement, Elizabeth yeah. really learned how to just flourish and just be with anyone and, yes. you know, really opened her up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean, that brings up something that we haven't mentioned yet is Elizabeth's younger sister, uh, Marguerite, who... Um, now we have, you know, after the passing of her father and her grandfather and her grandmother, we have the three of them remain. We have yeah. uh, Elizabeth, her younger sister, Marguerite, and her mother, and she called them the trio. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where she began to find her stability. And what's so interesting to me is um, the, the understanding of the, a trio where, you know, she really found her life um, growing up is also... You know, what's another trio that we talk about? The Holy Trinity. Mm, ah. uh, and so from the beginning, Elizabeth's already finding her home in this three. Yes. Um, it's kind of setting her up then to, to, to find her home in the, the eternal three of the, of the whole, most Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. and, and her mom, too, made a choice to, to educate them herself, you know, mm -hmm. because of a lot of the movement and didn't have a lot of trust maybe in, in some of the, the other options in her day, in her moment. Um, this was also a time of great anti-Catholicism in France and the state really trying to take over educational institutes. And, mm -hmm. um, and so her mom wanted to, yeah, teach them herself. And so, so that, so she had a, yeah, a lot of stability in that as well. Yes. You know? Yeah. Well, maybe we can turn now then and just say something about Elizabeth's personality. Um, I, I think it's always interesting to hear about the personality, especially when they're young of mm -hmm. the saints because they all have, you know, we all have different personalities and you can see how kind of the natural personalities, the natural tendencies, the strengths and the weaknesses, um, when you know those and you hear about those from the saints, you then see how God uses all things um, towards the holiness, towards of, of these people, towards like leading them to sanctity. And mm -hmm. so Elizabeth too, from a young age, she had, you know, her own strong personality. Yes. Yes, and you can get the impression reading maybe some of Liz's writings that, you know, you don't always get to see her per se, you know, and, and mm -hmm. see that the fire that she had, you know, because yeah. by that point, by the time she's writing in Carmel, you know, she's already been very purified, but, and, and kind of was able to channel that fire in a, in a really good direction. Mm -hmm. But that fire wasn't always channeled in great directions. And, right. and she had a very strong, yet yeah, willful um, character mm -hmm. and with a lot of anger, you know, I mean, that was her struggle. She was very... She says, my dominant fault is my sensitive nature. So she was very sensitive to like criticism mm -hmm. um, in any way, you know, and, and, and maybe to her mom's own kind of c control in some ways too, you know, mm -hmm. it just grated against her. Yeah. Um, and so from a very young age, she would have these like terrible temper tantrums. Yeah. We, and we see this, this strong personality from a very young age in her. Like there's, we have the, um, some of the things from her, her mother and her sister. I'll just read some of the quotes that they said. I mean, this is, you know, this is Elizabeth at one or two years old. Um, her mother said, she's a real devil. She is crawling and needs a fresh pair of pants every day. <laughs> And then even as an infant, she's called a big chatterbox. So, you know, you can imagine the infant just kind of talking away. Um, yeah, so you can see this, this, this strong personality from a very, very young age in Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, when, you know, when things did happen and went against her way, um, she would, you know, just f flip out. And, and you like, we were talking earlier, you know, for a two-year-old, it's one thing you kind of expect it, but as she was getting older, it still said she had temper tantrums every day, yes. you know, never went a day without one. And, and she began to be conscious of it, but she couldn't really change it. And she mm -hmm. didn't really, wasn't quite motivated yet. Um, but there was one moment where the neighbors testified that they would walk by, you know, in the, where their apartment was and they could hear, you know, Elizabeth like flipping out. And at one point, um, Elizabeth sometimes would, would uh, close the door like lock herself in and just bang, bang, bang against it, you know? Yeah. And at a certain moment, her mom was trying to kind of control that. So she closed another door. So Liz was kind of trapped between two doors mm. and she just started crying out. They're trying to murder me. They're trying to murder me. <laughs> and you know, her neighbors are hearing this, yes. the caramels across the street. Yes. Um, and um, so, so, but, but it just kept going. And that was the hard thing, you know, to the point yeah. where the mom would do what, you know, a lot of moms do this in our day where she would, um, start packing up Elizabeth's clothes and say, okay, we're, well, you're going to go to the, the reform school, you know, because the school for troubled girls that was right near their house. And basically the equivalent of saying, we're, I'm calling the police, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and um, so, but it, it's, I, I love the irony though, that the very school, the very reform school that Elizabeth was um, being threatened by 
um, now is St. Elizabeth of the Trinity Catholic School. You know, yes. <laughs> so just, uh, come on there. There you go, mom. Like how everything comes together. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. But, but it, but again, it just shows, you know, how strong that was mm-hmm. in, in her. Yeah. And it, for me, it's a good lesson too. And, um, I think often we can see our, our, our weaknesses as though, um, there are these big obstacles that'll keep us from a- achieving holiness. But what Elizabeth shows us is it's actually those it's that strong nature in her that was the very thing that made her holy. Yeah. It just took like this fine tuning and uh, a lot of work on, on her part and a lot of cooperation with God's grace mm-hmm. uh, to channel all of that energy, all of that passion towards the the one, you know, the good thing towards 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 God. Yes. Um, and I think the same thing in our lives, right? We have our our own misguided passions, um, whatever that might be, our appetites, our attachments, whatever that is. Um, and instead of trying to like deaden, we often we want to deaden the desire within us. Um, but it's it's not so much about deadening or like killing off the desire. <laughs> it's more about like how can I turn this desire from what's harmful for me towards what it's most helpful for me, what's going to help me to, to flourish as a human being. Yes. And a big part of it too is acceptance, you know, of, of mm-hmm. a, a real self-knowledge. Elizabeth showed even at a young age that she was aware of her struggle and yeah. she, she got to a point where she was willing to accept it and take it on, you yes. know, and, and just to be accept that this is something that maybe I was even born with, you know, or, mm-hmm. or for Elizabeth, her dad, they say for her dad passing away, she, she didn't, like there was a lot of unresolved anger because of that too. Mm-hmm. Why isn't my dad not here? Why don't I have this love in my life that I had before? And and that yeah. too would put her on edge. And w- things have happened to us, you know, that right. we're conditioned by many things. And and part of it is accepting it, being aware of it, and then with God's grace, you know, as you said, just really cooperating with that grace to to channel it. Yes. It, it, because God will use it in tremendous ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also we can see in Elizabeth then the um, the ways in which Again, that passion was a struggle for her, but also the how it it kind of set her up to be a saint. So one thing mm-hmm. they say is, um, you know, from a, a young, she's this young girl being, you know, and in, in the church and during the offertory, she's, you know, blowing kisses at the <laughs> the, the crucifix or, you know, she just has this like uh, kind of effusive spirit that you can see from a young age. It's just flowing out of her, um, this relational spirit, which again, we'll get to because I think, um, her 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 capacity for relationship is what allowed her to have this this very deep relationship with with God with yes. the Trinity. Yes, and and not to give yeah one side impression that she was just this like angry messed up little child like right. that was part of her like us we have our shadows but but she was she was very joyful child she was very like effusive very loving very affectionate and you see that all come out later on in her friendships and and yes. and things as well so it's a, it's a good point yeah one one. Um, anecdote or or I guess piece of writing that I really like is when Elizabeth was 14 years old in her her homeschooling her, her teacher had her write like a self portrait mm. and it's I think it's in the uh, volume 1 of of ICS's um writings complete works of Elizabeth of the Trinity I just want to read some of that because it's it's one thing to hear you know her mother and her do- um her sister describe her at a young age and it's another thing to think well what did 14 year old Elizabeth <laughs> think about herself and so I just find that the whole thing is very interesting so she starts out by describing her physical appearance um and she says without pride I think I can say my overall appearance is not displeasing I am a brunette and they say rather tall for my age I have sparkling black eyes, and my thick eyebrows give me a severe look. The rest of my person is insignificant. My dainty feet could win for me the nickname of Elizabeth of the Big Feet, like Queen Bertha. <laughs> and there you have my physical portrait. Mm-hmm. So it's just great to, to see, you know, the kind of the lightheartedness with which she took her um, herself. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, I think it's a good lesson in a way, too, that we especially at that age, she was able just to have a very balanced kind of view of herself, you yes. know, not too high, not too low, not too obsessive, you know, but just right. kind of, yeah, again, just accepting your reality yes, and, and being okay with that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then, so then she goes on in this assignment and she's describing then her, uh, her moral portrait. And she says, I would say that I have a rather good character. I am cheerful and I must confess somewhat scatterbrained. I have a good heart. Um, but she's also is quick to point out her, uh, her struggles as well, her weaknesses, she says, without necessarily being a model of patience. Mm. Um, but she usually knows how to control herself and she doesn't hold grudges. 
Um, so she points out, you know, and she ends, end, even ends it by saying, I have my defects and I have some good qualities as well. Mm -hmm. So just this very balanced view of, of her own strengths and weaknesses and, and yeah, where she was in her life. Yes. And, and not to give the impression that that was just pure nature, you know, because by 14, and we'll go back a little bit talking about her own kind of conversion. Um, but by 14, she already, you know, was praying every day and, and really striving to grow closer to Jesus and really, really, you know, um, saw Jesus as her best friend, God mm -hmm. as her best friend. And, and so one biographer points out that, um, that that really gave her an, equi an equilibrium that was remarkable for her age, you know, so to be able to see herself in a kind of just realistic light yes. and not be too upset either way by whatever she saw or her faults or defects, um, because she always had her best friend with her at every moment, you yeah. know, and for a teenager, especially to know you have someone who loves you so much, so close to you, just gives you a, a real security, mm. you know, that, that, that she enjoyed and that kind of bore fruit even just in her, her, her personality. Yeah. And we can see too, I mean, how her life of prayer, as you're pointing out, was um, what allowed her to have that self-knowledge. Just like, you know, St. Teresa of Avila is so big on is the importance of self-knowledge mm. and how truth, true self-knowledge comes through prayer. Um, in relationship with God. That's how we come to know our own hearts and our own weaknesses and our own strengths and to see ourselves in God's light. Um, and that's what Elizabeth was able to, to come to, this mm -hmm. realization, and and really kind of in some ways mature way ahead of her years um, because of the, the life of prayer that she was committed to. Yeah. I wonder if this would be a good moment to to kind of go back and say what what did bring about that life of prayer, you yes. know, and and you know to go from a little yeah a little child who blows kisses the crucifix to right. to Elizabeth the or, Trinity and going from the the child described as the real devil <laughs> yeah. to the one who can describe herself as um, you know not the model of patience but usually I know how to control myself exactly yeah, yeah. so I mean really it, um, this was this was a progression in Elizabeth's life and. Um, she is an example for us of virtue and of how virtue grows. Mm. It's not something that happened overnight. Um, this is something that she worked at very hard. She knew her own nature and she struggled with it. She fought with it. Um, and so on a natural level, she was working very hard. And then on a supernatural level, she was learning to let go and to surrender to, to God's grace. Yes. And you can even see this evolution too of her her awareness of how her behavior was affecting others. Mm -hmm. You know, when she saw that, whether it's through confession or through maybe a priest council or something she heard, that it might be displeasing to God, you know? It's like, it just, for whatever reason, that light didn't hadn't gone off before that. And so she sees this might be displeasing to God and actually hurts those who I love. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. So charity kind of already you see as the, as the basis for her wanting to change yeah. because she saw just, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, and, and then, you know, coming at, coming at her own weakness or inability to really control it, manage it on her own, mm -hmm. really led her to keep going deeper into seeking God's help, you know, yes. and, and in her own little way at the time, you know, she's maybe, you know, nine years old, eight years old as she's doing this, but, but there's, there's a sense that she needs God yes. for this. Yeah. And there's, there's a, um, her, her biographers point out how important the sacraments were in her life and in, in her own journey. And so we see, um, kind of the beginning of this conversion for her was with her first confession when she was seven years old. That's when she was kind of the preparation for the, the sacrament, but also receiving the, her first confession was this kind of awakening moment to uh, her own weakness and uh, her need for conversion. Mm. Um, and it's, I find it, it, this is, I mean, it, she was seven at the time, but this is even today is still my, my own, um, it's just the way I see things, it, my, my own human nature sometimes where, you know, she goes in and she basically, you know, says what she's done wrong or, and she says, you know, I'm never going to have any outrages again of anger. <laughs> you know, I'm done with that. That's never again, you know, or she'll, there's, there's stories that she would write to her, these notes to her mother uh, for New Year's. And she'd always make these resolutions to her mother about how she was never going to have any fits of anger again, you know. So here she is, seven years old, making this promise to her mother. And of course, <laughs> like it probably took a matter of two days before she's <laughs> throwing another outrageous fit. Um, but it's because of that of, that she became to the realization that she can't do it on her own. Yeah. I mean, she kept trying. She did what she could mm -hmm. to fight her anger. Um, and she really did fight. I mean, yeah. there's there's stories of her 
um, you know, getting upset and you could see she's like a boiling kettle. Like, you know, there's like tears coming out of yeah. her eyes because she's like, she's turning red. because <laughs> She just wants to like jump out and yell or scream and break out into this fit. Um, and yet she remembers, you know, that she needs to try to control herself. Mm. And so she's learning to cooperate with God's grace by failing. Yes. yes. Um, because again, at, at seven, she just wasn't wasn't there yet and yeah. it took many many years and then finally by the time of her first first communion which is when she was 10 um i mean three long years of struggling with this she had a i guess a more definitive conversion it doesn't mean that i mean she continued to struggle probably with this sensitivity for the rest of her life but um it was really only with god's grace through the sacrament that she was able to come to this peace. Yeah, and it does, there is a, a marked change, you know, that even her friends noticed that the, yes. t- you know, witnesses of, of her process will will talk about that. Um, you know, at, at the time of Holy Communion, again, very similar to St. Therese in the sense of seeing it as this true kind of spousal union. Mm-hmm. And, and what I mentioned at the beginning of Elizabeth just wanted to be authentic. She wanted to really love, you know, she wanted to respond as best she could to, to this love that God had given her. And she experienced that in communion really, maybe, I don't know, say for the first time, but maybe like really profoundly in a way for the first time where it was like Jesus was awaiting her. He was initiating this love relationship with her, giving himself to her. Mm. And and it was such a, a consolation for her and such a, a deep moment of intimacy that she said, I just, I all I want to do is give everything to you, basically. Like you've given so much to me. I want to give everything to you. And, and she knew you know, that was where she could then really overcome her, those, yeah. those outbursts, yeah. you know, it, it flowed from that, mm. that encounter. Yeah. To me, that just really reveals something about the way that God's grace works in our lives. Um, I don't know. I think our tendency sometimes is to think we have to fight sin with our own efforts and, and that will then like somehow bring down God's <laughs> grace or something. When the reality, it's like, no, we have to fight with all of our effort, um, but so that we realize that we can't do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what opens us up to God's grace. Yes. So it's it's kind of just like turning turning the whole thing on its head, the way that we conceptualize God's grace. And and it's not something that we can do on our own, but yet it's something that we have to, to work at virtue yes. the best that we can um, for the sake of, of then being receptive to the gift that God God's going to do it in us. Yes, and, and, and the primacy of love too. You know, it's not... It's not a fight, and even the struggle um, to struggle and, and fail and keep coming back, you know, that itself too is not so I can just become a good person, you know, mm-hmm. so I can like just be the best person I can be or just be a loving person because that's still so self focused, you yeah. know. Um, not that those aren't, those are good things, you know, and they do help us. I mean, we need to kind of pass through that phase, but. But with Elizabeth, you saw it just, it was all about love, you know, mm-hmm. it was about responding in love to Jesus that made her want to do this, yes. you know, and, and wanting to, to, to not hurt this mom who loved her so much, mm-hmm. you know, that though it's like, so those, you can just see, yeah, like how we need to be moved by love first, mm-hmm. you know, in order to the really, to really overcome the things that, that God is asking us to overcome. Yeah, that's great. Amen. Um, and then we can see too, um, in this this development, this maturing that's going on in Elizabeth, uh, the it's kind of opening up the great depths of her spiritual life. She was already seen, you know, at a very young age to have been been very prayerful and and recollected, but that's just something that's going to continue to deepen. Again, I think well beyond her years, and in, in some sense, she was seen as being this person of deep, deep prayer yeah. um, from the time she's you know ten, yeah. twelve, fourteen years old. Yeah. And it's a mis- again, it's sort of mysterious, and there's it's not always easy too to like trace all those things back. We don't have you know enough maybe like records or material to. She does she did have a little diary, you know, and yeah. um, but it just seems like yeah, early on, she it says she started practicing real silent prayer at the age of twelve, you know, mm-hmm. like like a kind of disciplined routine, using um, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Last Supper was like these new meditations she really liked and. Um, she said she didn't really use a book too much, and she was also filled, filled with tears during her thanksgivings after communion. So th- something, you know, and maybe you could say it was communion um, before that too, but first communion definitely kind of helped spur that on. Mm-hmm. But just this real sense that that's how she was going to find God, you know, mm-hmm. was in her interior. And and yeah. and maybe I, part of me thinks too it's the struggle with her own interior passions mm-hmm. that helped her 
to that too, you know? It's like, cause you have to like, you really have to grow in your interior life in order to struggle in that way and be so aware of your own movements, right. you know? And so maybe that was where she really found God too, mm-hmm. was because that's where her biggest struggle was. And so, so early on, she just had this sense of interior prayer as really her path, yeah. you know, and, and not a self-consciousness about it too much, and, mm. but just, just kind of living it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she um, kind of witnesses to me, to the power of, of daily prayer, mm. because it was something that she was committed to from a young age. And so um, God used that in her, and, and she grew um, just incredibly quickly, I think, in a spiritual, uh, spiritual sense, because she was, again, the primacy of love there, though. So it wasn't like, this is this, this task that I have to do. Um, in a sort of oppressive sort of way. But yeah. it's like, this is the one that I love, the one that I yes. want to spend time with every single day. And she was committed to that from a young age, from 12 years old. And so then by the time we get to when she's like 18 or 19, she's already been practicing a life of prayer for seven years. And, yes. Uh, it just really has these great spiritual depths. Yes. And and I think, as you had mentioned before, like her effusiveness, you know, and her mm-hmm. her like great relational, rela- relationality, uh, that's a word, um, also like pushed her in that direction that she mm-hmm. wanted to be with this one that she loved so much, you yes. know, and she, and, and that was just her nature too, to want to be with those she loved. And, and mm-hmm. so to be able to really believe that now it's, it's another part of her authenticity is like once she, once Elizabeth understood a truth, it was like, she didn't go back on it in mm-hmm. a way, you know, it was like, it's like she had to, she had to be sort of faithful to it. Mm-hmm. And, and even though that meant a lot of struggle sometimes, you know, but but just this truth that Jesus really was with her, that God really dwelt within her. Yeah. Um, she was able to take that truth and just give herself to mm-hmm. it. You know, what like what are the consequences of that? Well, right. therefore, I should try to be with him mm-hmm. as much as I can. But not in this oblig- obligatory way, but really finding an outlet for her. Yeah. Her, her love, her effusiveness, you know, her personality. Right. Yeah, and, and maybe some of the kind of... Um... The major uh, steps along the way that really helped her to grow. Um, one thing I would say is I think when she was around 18 or 19, she started reading Teresa of Avila and um, soaking in the the spiritual wisdom of, of our Holy Mother Teresa of Avila, reading The Way of Perfection, which you mentioned her mother had the book, mm. um, so she would have had access to it then. Um, but she was also reading another Carmelite at that time, uh, around the time of 18 or, or 19 years old, yeah, she had just discovered St. Therese's Story of a Soul, which had just come out. You know, I mean, Therese had died in 1897, and this is around 1899 mm-hmm. that that Elizabeth discovers the autobiography. It had come out in 1898. And so finding it, she it, it wasn't... It wasn't that it was like this eureka experience. She already had this like deep sense of God's mercy and his love for her, his personal love for her. Um, but it did help kind of like clarify her path in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. and she really found in St. Therese like a real sister, a real kindred spirit. Yes. And giving word to like kind of helped her articulate her experiences and her intuitions and gave her a, a certain framework to see her relationship with God and grow deeper in this way of confidence, of love, yes. you know, of, of just the primacy of love, of trust. Yeah. Um, and she had her own, you know, scrupulosity and struggles too, that I'm not sure if we'll touch on this episode, maybe in another, mm-hmm. um, but, but I think Teresa's experience too helped her kind of give voice to some of her own struggles, interior struggles, yeah. scrupulosity. And it, so, yeah, it was a very providential encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it really set her up to kind of grow deeper too in her Carmelite. Carmelite path. Yes. Yeah. And then around that very same time, um, there was this parish mission that was taking place at her parish. Um, this is when Elizabeth was, I think, 19, 18 or 19 um, years old. And this was another um, just like kind of pinpoint in her life that I think made a, a big impact on her her trajectory mm. um, and her spiritual growth. Yeah. Yeah. The, the This parish mission, you know, it's really in, incredible when you read about it because yeah. it was like, the bishop, I guess, invited like a whole team of redemptorists to like the, the whole city of Dijon. Mm-hmm. And every parish, you know, had this like kind of team. And, and it was this, this huge, you know, event for the city and, and really to try to bring conversion. And, and again, the Catholic, France was passing through a very difficult anti-Catholic moment in its mm-hmm. history. Um, and so, but, but they were fiery, you know. I mean, this yeah. is some 19th century French, you know, tinged with kind of some of that rigorism sort of, you know, and... and 
um, I won't say the J word, um, but, <laughs> but um, <laughs> and, and these intense, you know, fiery preachers really, you know, for Elizabeth, in some ways it was good. Um, it, I mean, in many ways it was good, but it also, her sensitive nature kind of, you, you know, really felt shocked in certain ways by some of this preaching, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, but it, yeah, I don't know if you can maybe go into a little more depth on like how that, yeah, how that worked for her. Yeah. Well, I like how you just point out how amazing this whole, like it's so different from our our experience in parishes now, right? Like they, we think of a parish mission, maybe they'd have like a day or something like this is a whole month, a whole month where they have like two talks a day and mass and like everyone from the town comes, even those who like aren't Catholic end up coming in at different points to the, the parish mission. So it's like the whole town is just like revolving around this, this parish experience. And um it's just, it's really funny, like historically reading back about this, because there was these two redemptorists that came to Elizabeth's parish. And one of them was, uh, well, their, their names translated. One of them is, is Father Lamb and the other one's Father Lion. And uh, Father Lion is this preacher who's much more like uh, calm and like, you know, gentle. And then there's Father Lamb and he's like the fiery preacher. So Father Lamb is the one who in the evenings, you know, when, when everyone's there, he's the one who really gets, you know, gets fiery and, and preaching and, and gets everyone worked up. But so the whole, the whole situation is just very funny. But we know so much about this parish mission in part because Elizabeth was journaling. Um, she's writing in her diary you know, after each of the talks, she comes back and she gives kind of a summary, some sense of an objective summary about what was said, but then also about what struck her. Mm. And um, you can see already the the spiritual maturity in her. Um, She was receiving obviously like new lights, I think especially at this time, um, I think it was kind of in the context of this parish mission that she really was reaching the point of supernatural prayer for Mm. the first time. Um, so there was something, some serious grace that she's receiving here. But also we see, too, um, how she was able to transcend some of the maybe the weaknesses of of her time. Like you mentioned, the, the J word, Jansenism. Uh, <laughs> I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, just, it's just overused, that's all. Uh, yeah, yeah. This theological <laughs> theological uh, struggle and tendency of her time in France. Yeah, and, and they were trying to, you know, awaken very hardened people, yes. you know, who had been away from the church for a long time, probably maybe were anti-Catholic. And so these, the, you know, setting up these theatrical kind of scenarios of a soul, a, a, a sinner who never repented comes before the last judgment to the, the to the, you know, stern Christ. And, yeah. and the devil is saying all these things that he did. And then the Christ says, you know, get out of my presence, you know, yeah. you cursed into the fire. And, and, and those kind of things that, you know, for Elizabeth probably didn't need that so much. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but she, but it was good for her to have to deal with some of that too, of like, cause her experience of God was just pure mercy, pure love, you know, yes. and how to, how to understand that in relationship to Christ is a just judge, but yet, is, is, is pure merciful love as well, you know? Yes. And so, yeah. so it was good for her to have to struggle with some of that stuff, but it did also, yeah, it did kind of create some, you know, some tension, but, um, but you, and, but you did mention a good word with supernatural prayer and it might be good to explain mm. that. Like, what do you mean when you say, yeah, she's yeah. Just starting that. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. When I say supernatural prayer, I'm not necessarily talking about like these extraordinary mystical graces necessarily. Um, but more that she was experiencing contemplation. So like the kind of pure, just like silent prayer of, of contact with God. Um, the prayer that, that we can't do on our own, but we can only receive the grace that God's giving us. So her prayer matured in the sense of before she was probably doing much more active prayer, a lot more like vocal prayer and things like that. And just like, yeah, active meditation, like yes. shit on the, on, the, on the agony in the garden or just like really kind of. Exactly. Yeah. And we see this stark transition to um, a time when her periods of prayer were basically her just sitting in silence. Yeah. Um, and just being with Jesus. Yeah. Um, so there was this this movement that was happening, and it, it seemed like um, it was centered somewhat around this parish mission. Also, you know, meeting with one of the priests who was giving the mission helped her to um, d- kind of discern, you know, the movement that God was doing in her soul. So mm-hmm. this was all very important and as far as her kind of spiritual, um, uh, her growth during this time. Yes. You know, we don't want to give the impression either, because even though she started prayer at a young age and was very, like, you know, pious, so to speak, but she, but no, like, people don't talk about her as if she was this kind of like, you know, like strange, almost in her religiosity or like super extreme or 
somehow she was just a very lively social young woman you know yes. from and and had a lot of friends a lot of people around her people maybe who weren't so religious either but she just had a good influence on them and so she had this remarkable kind of balance to have this deep interior life but then just be yeah a very kind of normal young woman you right. know in her day um so it might be worth yeah kind of how yes. what that looked like and how she was able to attain that sort of equilibrium yes yeah because i think often we have the mistaken view of of what sanctity looks like right so it's like this if elizabeth's a saint and she was holy at this age and then it just means she like woke up and went and prayed in the church all, mm. all day and it's like no she was this young woman who was you know traveling around and going to dances and you know she liked to get all dressed up and wear nice clothing and um she was very just lively and relational and um she was she was a a, a, a very normal teenager but at the same time a very extraordinary mm -hmm. teenager yes yeah there's a great a couple little uh, quotes or anecdotes where um, it said one of the, the one of her friends from that period said that Elizabeth, when she danced, it was so gracefully. Um, it was with rhythm in her bones and charity in her heart. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. And then, um, and then she said to her friend, you know, in in worldly gatherings, I have a lot of fun until midnight, and afterward, I prepare myself for communion. Yes. You know? yeah. So again, just shows that that her ability to kind of hold both those things without seeing them yes. as contradicting each other you know yeah. the, the fun the social time and then her deep relationship with god yeah and that's i mean something that's so catholic right this idea of like we can we can celebrate we can enjoy our, enjoy life joy enjoy the gifts that god has given us um it's good to have a good time mm -hmm. um but then also it it means um when, when the time comes to to pray when the time comes to to go to church we're very serious about those things as well yes. so elizabeth it, they're not in contradiction for yes. elizabeth it's all like giving praise to god yeah um she just saw that as her whole life and that that one kind of lens yes and and she was able to 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 kind of have moments of recollection even in the midst of mm. these gatherings and things like that too you know so yeah. she was never far from jesus or was mm. never like well this is my time with my friends and then this is gonna be my time with god you know, it, it was all one. It was all one with her. And it that was her kind of her trajectory. And it, But you can see it starting now where it's like always just being in the presence of God. Yeah. No matter what she's doing. Um, and, and, and you know, just enjoying other people and, and really having a good influence on people too because she didn't seem scary. She didn't mm -hmm. seem, you know, they just saw her as good and something beautiful about her, her eyes, you know, just the way yeah. she looked at people just, just drew people and helped them feel loved. Um, and yeah, and it just can say like how we can, and, and for young people too, yes. that is possible to kind of right. to kind of do it. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, connected with all of this is Elizabeth's love for music. And this is something um, I mean, myself, somewhat of a musician, is is one way that Elizabeth really speaks to me. Is um, she started studying piano from a very young age? Her her mother sent her to a uh, music school when she was eight years old. She began taking piano lessons and. Um, I think, you know, in her, her mother's mindset, it was training her to become, she was going to be a piano teacher one day. That's what her mom saw her, her career uh, looking ahead. But Elizabeth ended up being um, very talented at piano from, from a young age. And she won a, a lot of awards, uh, at different music contests. And, um, you know, I was reading through some of the, uh, we actually have a lot of detail about the, even the things that Elizabeth played um, because she won these awards and so it would be in the newspaper mm. and so we have the newspaper still from that time where they talk about you know it, describing elizabeth as she played some piece um and just how her fingers you know flew across the the keys and and how she played with such such heart and soul um but she was very talented so like one one example is um, when she was 13, she pr played a piece uh, from from Litz, that the second Hungarian Rhapsody, mm. which is described as one of the most difficult pieces ever written for piano. <laughs> and so here she is, 13 years old, and she's yeah. playing this piece. Um, she was just really, really talented. Yeah. Um, but one thing that was interesting, I think, is her, her younger sister, uh, Marguerite, was also very good at piano. Um, but there was a difference in the way that they played that people noted. Mm. Um, it was noted that maybe her younger sister had more technical ability, but Elizabeth played more with her heart. Mm. Um, she really saw it as, uh, again, it's this deep passion that's coming within her, uh, a way to express her love for God. 
and she saw her her playing in, in that that light. Yes. And and to the fact you said that she was well known. I mean, she was a you said she was a minor celebrity in Dijon, mm-hmm. you know, because of her performances and and so it was such an important thing to her. And yet she didn't she didn't make it her identity either, her yeah. success, I guess. You know, right. she was she was able to roll with it and not let it get to her head and not also have a false humility about it, but she, because she was because she played for God, you know, yes. because it was a channel, an outlet for her love, for her effusiveness, her, mm-hmm. her, 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 her generous heart, um, it, it kept her balanced, too, mm-hmm. in that sense, you yeah. know, and it kept her just from, from finding too much, you know, of her sense of self wrapped up with her success in music, even though she was so successful. Right. Yeah, and I think we'll get back to this in later episodes, but um, music began to be uh, maybe like a, a context uh, in which she saw the world too and in which she saw her spiritual life. So mm-hmm. music will be very important. Um, it's been pointed out that uh, Therese was much more visual. Um, she used a lot of images, you know, flowers and elevators and things like this, whereas Elizabeth was much more auditory. And so she uses uh, music and, and silence especially mm-hmm. and, and noise. Like these are the way that she describes spiritual reality she uses a lot of musical terms like harmony or she talks about harp the harp the vibration of the string and Mm -hmm. instruments and things like that so um and it's in that context of music and and that she can understand silence in a very profound way and and speak about silence in a very profound way so that's something i think we'll we'll talk about in a later episode yeah well good um maybe just to conclude then we can say that um, for this episode, that a lot of what we know about Elizabeth, you know, is from accounts of people telling about her at this young age, but also there's a good amount of writing from her, her that she wrote herself. There was her diary. Um, she wrote before she entered the, the uh, monastery at age 21, she wrote something like 70, around 75 poems as well. Um, and we have 85 letters or around 85 letters from her before she entered Carmel as well. And so, that's one way that we can know so much about the interior of what what Elizabeth uh, was thinking, what yeah. she was, what her life was like. Um, so it's a real a real gift, and you know some of these books are available through through ICS Publications. So if you want to learn more about uh, about Elizabeth, that's where I would I would turn. Yeah, and it's no, it's not like it's less spirituality or boring, or it's it it, it really does just enhance your whole understanding of Elizabeth's path by yes. seeing her even in her young age. She, you can see you know, her depth already. And it's, right. it's, it's worth it. Yeah. 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 So we've been through, you know, in this episode, about 20 years of her life, but we've purposely left out a very important <laughs> part. And that is her vocation, her call to Carmel. And we purposely left that out because we want to give an entire episode to it in the next episode. So, um, you know, please join us in our next episode. We'll dive into Elizabeth's uh, call to Carmel and uh, her learning to accept and, and the struggles that she went through in, in accepting that call of God. And God bless you.